Well, good morning, folks. It's good uh, to see you all gathered out as we meet for worship today. It's kind of a funny day out there, isn't it? It's uh, one minute that's sunshine and the next minute it's rain, but it's not what they talk about, sunshine and showers. But regardless of what is happening outside, it's good to be in and the warmth of the, the meeting house with you here this morning. It's good to gather together. If you're watching with us online or, or on DVD, it's good uh, to have you with us as well. But we do I look forward to the day when you'll, you'll join with us uh, in the building here. Uh, I trust you have been seeing a few of the announcements scroll around, uh, as I had said at the beginning of the service. Um, there are a number I want to highlight today. Um, I thought that would cut down the announcements. It does in, in some sense, but uh, there are a few just to, to remind you of. PW this Tuesday, uh, that's for all ladies, whether you've been to PW before or not. I know you've been made very welcome uh, in the main hall. Uh, at 8 p.m. this Tuesday, uh, where, where Valerie is, is the speaker um, for, for that. So I know she'd love to see the hall filled from front to back. Uh, but you'll be a bit more than welcome. Congregational meeting then, uh, followed by a session meeting uh, the following Tuesday, uh, the 12th of October, uh, at 7.30 p.m. So if you know someone from committee or, or session who's not here uh, today, uh, please pass that on to them. And next Sunday uh, is our Harvest Sunday. Again, we're, because we're still in restrictions and so on, it will be slightly different uh, than it has been uh, previous years. Um, but we've got used to things being a little bit simpler and so on. This year, uh, it will still be simpler again. But it's good to come out and to gather uh, and to thank God uh, at this harvest time. Morning service, uh, as usual, here at 11.30, um, where I'll be leading that service. And then... The evening service at 6.30 p.m. I encourage you all uh, to come back um, where well, there'll be some that looks like me coming back again. Um, my brother Keith from the, the Cumber Churches uh, will be our speaker uh, in the evening. Uh, it'll be good uh, to have him, with him, well, uh, have him with us here. Uh, just in regards to, to harvest, uh, I suppose normally we do bring fruit and veg and all those sorts of things, but again, we've got used not to doing that. So if you've seen the little announcement there, I would encourage you next week, instead of doing those sorts of things, uh, we're going to bring the trolley back over. Uh, if you remember the trolley that was in the, the entrance of the hall there uh, for foodstuffs for the, the food bank, tin food, packaged food and stuff like that there. If you want to bring some of that along, uh, it would be good uh, so that we can pass it on and help those uh, less fortunate uh, than ourselves. Uh, you'll have seen a, an announcement on the, the screen there about the General Assembly. Again, it's a little bit different this year. It's normally in June. There was none last year. And this year's is taking place this Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So there'll be no drop-in uh, on Tuesday because I'll be at a General Assembly uh, in Belfast. Uh, it is available online. Um, if you want to watch it, uh, it'll be live-streamed uh, through the, the PCA website if you want to, to follow it. Uh, but can I encourage you uh, to pray for the General Assembly this year? Because we haven't met for uh, a couple of years, really, uh, and there's lots of stuff to be discussed and talked about. Uh, we'll be praying uh, for that later on, but I want to encourage you in your own time uh, to pray for that as well. We've already hit the Belfast Telegraph um, because one of the topics uh, this year being discussed is the whole issue of gender identity and, and all that there. So we've hit the headlines already. We did do a number of years ago. So please pray uh, for the assembly that we would have wisdom and discernment in our discussions. Uh, the pound jar, you'll have seen the announcement. I just want to thank you personally for all who continue uh, to support the pound jar and the, and the little copper jars, or shrapnel jars as we've called them. Um, for September alone was £492 in the pound jar and the copper jar is £115 uh, for one month. So uh, a great effort uh, by all who have taken part. A great uh, simple fundraising effort. Um, up to this point, it hasn't been running that long, um, but up to this point it has raised uh, just over £9,000 for the building fund. It's amazing something so simple uh, can raise that amount of money. So well done, folks, and, and thank you uh, for your support. Uh, BB and GB, uh, I want to highlight their registration. I think there's some confusion over when that's taking place. That's not this Monday and uh, Thursday. It's the following Wednesday and Thursday, the 11th and 14th uh, of October at 6.30 to 7.30. If you have children involved in either organization, there will be representatives there on both evenings 
uh, to do with the, to deal with the registration of both those organisations. So you're welcome to come along on either of those evenings. And there'll be further details about what's happening and guidelines and all that sort of stuff available on those evenings. The last thing you will notice, we mentioned it last week, the Bibles are back in the pews again. Uh, so when we come to read God's Word together, if you want to pick one up, um, you can do so. It would be good uh, to do that. It's still on the screen, but it would be good uh, to, to actually read, physically read God's Word uh, together. Just a reminder, uh, as I said last week, uh, it must be within your own little family bubble and so on. You can't be passing them back and forward uh, and all that there, but they are there uh, for uh, your use. Right, I'm saying no more. That's the cut-down version of the announcements. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, we're here uh, to worship God and to lead us uh, into our worship, to focus our, our minds. I want to read a few verses uh, from First Timothy. Uh, it should tie with what we're thinking about and what we're singing about uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, First Timothy uh, chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. The wonderful thing, a wonderful reminder of the promise that we have, that even though we may feel we are the worst of sinners, like Paul did, that God's grace through Christ is available for all of us who would believe. With that in mind, uh, let's stand and let's sing our first uh, piece of praise together. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
Let's just bow in prayer uh, together as we come uh, to worship together. Let's, let's talk to God for a moment. Let's, let's pray. Our Father God, it, well, it might be an old, old story, but it's certainly a wonderful and magnificent story. That you, the great almighty God of heaven, that you, the God who created and sustains the world as we know it, sent Jesus and all his power and all his glory and in all his love down to this earth as, as your remedy for our sin. To pay the price for, well, for our wonderful redemption and restoration from our disobedience to you and indeed our rejection of your love for us. And Father, we have to confess how easily we do forget this simple yet amazing story. How we too easily forget that we are sinners in need of saving. And how easily we turn to the glory and entrapment of all that the world has to offer. The empty glory of self and self-satisfaction that costs us so dear. And it only drives us farther and farther away from you. And Father, as we meet and as we worship here today, I'll be praying that your spirit would move powerfully amongst us to convict us of those selfish hearts, to turn our focus back to you and, yeah, drive us to our knees in genuine and heartfelt confession and repentance. We pray, Father, that our stubborn hearts would be softened, our hardened minds would be opened so that we would acknowledge our waywardness before you, the one true, holy, righteous, and incomparable God. And Father, we are so thankful that you are willing to forgive us. We thank you that it is in your heart to forgive us and we thank you that it is your desire to pour mercy and blessing upon blessing into our lives. And so today, Father, as we confess our willful disobedience to you, will you wash us, will you cleanse us through the power of the blood of our Savior Jesus? Will you comfort us with your love and draw us nearer to you? to your grace and mercy. Build us up. Strengthen us. Feed us and nourish us through your truth proclaimed here in word and in song. That we might know a joy, a peace, a comfort in our hearts as they're touched again by your mercy, your truth and your love today. <coughs> Father God, we, we worship you. We adore you. We commit our ways to you and you alone, trusting only in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn to God's Word together now. As I say, it's on the screen, but it'll be good. And now we have our Bibles back in the pews again to, to read it together. Uh, we're going to uh, read again Jonah chapter 3. As you'll see from the screen there, it's on page 928 of the Pew Bible, if you want to turn to it and read it along with me in the Pew Bible. But either way, let's read God's Word together. Jonah chapter 3, reading from verse 1, page 928. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, 
covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and then, and with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Amen. We thank God for his word and do trust as we think about that uh, passage again today uh, that uh, God will speak to us uh, through it. But we want to take a moment or two uh, to, to speak to more primarily to our, our young people gathered with us. It's always good uh, to have that opportunity uh, to share something uh, with you uh, today. I'm going to put a, a wee slide up. Well, the guys at the back are going to put a, a little slideshow up uh, and I'm going to uh, read through it. And I want to read uh, a few other passages of Scripture as, as we go through it. Um, are we up? Just hoping the computer doesn't die again. Three hours, and we got the answer to the first one already there. But you can't, you can't trust the, the, the technology at all, can you? I was going to ask you, does any of the young people know what the three hours are? And I was, I'll be careful in saving us older folk know them, who I'm talking to. What's the three R's? We all know the three R's. Reading, writing, and arithmetic at work this time. Three R's. And that's what I want to think about. Uh, a number of different three R's. And I'm sure young people like me, whenever I first heard that, that's not three R's, sure it's not. It sounds like it. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> You have to leave words out. It's not very good, three hours, sure it's not. But that's what they call it, the three hours of education, reading, writing, and arithmetic. I have another three, and it's about being green. Does that give you a wee hint? We're encouraged to be greener today. We're encouraged to think about our environment and so on. Are they coming to your mind now? Yeah. Regis. Reuse, recycle. I'm going to cheat. Look, I had them written down there just in case I forgot. Because <laughs> the old head's not what it used to be. Reduce, recycle, and reuse. So there's two sets of three R's that we're very used to and used to hearing uh, in these days. But I want to think uh, about another three R's that I'm going to put up uh, in a minute or two. But I want to read uh, a couple of passages from the Bible. Um, if I can flick to them here. First talks about God's love for us. And then I'm going to read one that we normally only hear at Christmas. But it gives us three more hours that we think about when we're thinking about God, when we're thinking about God's love for us, and what we need to do. First is First John chapter 4, uh, reading from verse 9. Be familiar to, to many of us. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Doesn't that give us a great description of God's love for us? Not that we loved God, but God loved us. So even when we don't love God, when we do all the wrong things, when we look to the wrong things in the world, the Bible tells us God still loves us, and he loves us so much that he sent his son into this world that whenever we believe and trust in him, we can know eternal life. It's not the, the wonderful thing, the message of Scripture. But let me read this, uh, these few verses. Uh, from, it's from John's Gospel, chapter 1. 
the bigger people will, will know these verses as, as well. As I say, it's a familiar one that we read every Christmas uh, about the Word coming into the world. And the Word, of course, is Jesus. And it says this, we've already thought about God loving us so much that he sent Jesus into the world. And this is where we get our three R's that I want us to think about today. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You remember those words, especially us older people? We read them, as say, every Christmas. But there's two, the first two hours are very obvious in that. And I suppose the question is, what will we do with the information that we're thinking about? God loves us so much that he sent his son into this world so that we could have that wonderful relationship with God. Will we reject him? tells us there in that passage from John's gospel that even though Jesus came into the world that he created, it was his world and it's the people he created. People rejected him. They didn't want to know anything about him. And it's not a terrible thing. We reject Jesus. But of course the great promise that we've just talked about it's not when we reject Jesus, but when we receive him. Because it says all who receive him become children of God. When we receive this wonderful news that Jesus came into this world for us, we become part of God's family. We are children of God, brothers and sisters together. I'm sure you've heard the big people talking in church, maybe call each other brother and sister, because we are, when we are God's people, when we receive Christ, when we trust in Christ, we become part of God's family. But there's another R I want us to think about. Those are the two main R's that we think about. Will we reject what God has done for us, or will we receive Jesus as our friend and as our Savior? And if we do, if we do, then there's a third R. And I've put it in as reflect. What does reflect mean? Anybody want to tell me? It kind of shows it on the screen there, doesn't it? There's two reflects. There's the first one, and there's one that's almost an exact image of it. When we are part of God's family, we are to reflect Jesus. Isn't that what Paul said when we were, or in John's letter when we read earlier on? He said we, we reflect Jesus when we are, when we have accepted Jesus as our Savior. Others should see that in us. And that's important for us as big people as well as, as younger people. That when people look at us, they don't see the, the imperfections and all the things that we've done wrong, but that they see Jesus through us. They get a little taste of Jesus. And then they too have that choice to reject and receive. And so the cycle continues. Young folk, old folk alike, we've thought quite a lot over this past couple of weeks and we're going to think again about this great revival where all these people were saved and none of it. What will we do with Jesus today? Will we reject him? Will we receive him as our saviour? And if we do, let's get out there and reflect Jesus to the world around us. Let's pray together before we sing. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you sent him into this world 
Lord, that we might know eternal life, to pay the penalty as we say for our sins. When we put our faith and trust in him, we become one big, amazing family here. Lord, we pray for our young people. Lord, as they hear that, that message about Jesus, both in Sunday school and here in church, Lord, in their homes and, Lord, wherever they be, Lord, we pray that you would speak to them, that they may come to know you as Lord and Savior, even at that early age. Lord, they would grow up coming to know more and more about you. Lord, being that reflection of you in school, in work, wherever we find ourselves. So, Lord, speak to each of us about what we will do with Jesus. We pray in his name, in his name alone. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand, we're going to sing together our children's hymn. We only normally sing this around Easter, but I think it's appropriate we sing about it today. When I think about the cross, when I think of Jesus, I'm reminded of his love, love that never leaves me. And the last verse goes on to talk and issue that challenge about what we will do with Jesus. Have we actually thought about what Jesus has done for us? Let's stand and let's sing this together. <laughs> Pause, uh, as always, in the midst of our service to take time uh, to come together in prayer once again uh, together. To take time to pray for the needs uh, of others. As I say, there's a, a number of things we've already thought about that uh, need our prayer. We want to pray for our General Assembly, but of course we want to pray for those uh, we know and love who are facing difficult circumstances, as always. Uh, we want to pray for our church fellowship uh, as well and the things uh, that are beginning uh, to resume and come back uh, there again as well. As the good Lord, as we say, brings those situations to your mind, uh, I encourage you to bring them to God in prayer. But allow me to lead you 
in this time of prayer. Let's, let's pray together. Father, as the psalmist uh, reminds us, in the morning, Lord, you hear our voices. In the morning, we lay our request before you and wait expectantly. And Lord, we thank you for this amazing privilege of prayer, to be able to pause in the midst of our service, to take time to, to think of others and indeed incede, intercede into their uh, particular situations. Lord, we do pray or that you would speak to each and every one of us, whether we find ourselves in that situation or it's someone we know and love from our fellowship here uh, or indeed from our, our natural families and circle of friends. Lord, we pray that you would help us to lift that burden to you. We do want to pray as always for those we know in our families who are facing those difficult times, who know face the troubles and trials of life through illness whether that's physical emotional even spiritual as we often say or those who know the the heartache and pain of suffering in this life those who know that heartache of bereavement or whether that's in recent weeks months and even years or do you know the situations which burden each of us? Lord, we pray that you would intercede into those situations that, Lord, we know you as the Almighty God can, can change those situations. But Lord, whether that situation changes or not, we know that you're with us through those situations. And Lord, we pray for those who are facing those times that they would know something of your help, something of your comfort and indeed strength as they face their own particular burden. And Lord, we pray for our General Assembly as we've already thought about. There's much to be talked about. There's much to be discussed, much to be decided. Lord, issues which no doubt bring us into the, the light of the media and in society. But Lord, issues which, yes, impact us as your people here uh, on this earth. Lord, we pray for the, the meetings themselves. We pray for those organizing them, that all the restrictions will be in place for everyone's safety. and All run smoothly, but above all else, we pray for, yes, for wisdom and discernment in all the discussions. Lord, with those sensitive issues like gender identity and same-sex attraction and all the rest of it, Lord, issues which are very much in the public realm at the minute. Lord, we pray for sensitivity in all the discussions that are held. But Lord, we pray that all those issues would be thought through carefully, prayerfully, and of course, above all else, with biblical discernment that only comes from you. Lord, be with each person who attends that assembly, Lord, each one who will speak, Lord, each who will, no doubt, vote on these different issues. Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us as well as your, well as our denomination here in this country. Lord, we pray for our own life and witness as your family and fellowship here. We've also said there's so much beginning to come back again as restrictions ease. And Lord, as restrictions continue to change, as we often pray, we pray you'd help us to adjust to those. We pray for PW Tuesday evening. We pray for Valerie as she speaks to the, the ladies there. We pray for our harvest services next Sunday. Lord, we pray that we would come with joy and thanksgiving in our heart. Lord, thankful. Yes, coming specifically to thank you for the material blessings, but so much more to be thankful for. Lord, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. But Lord, as we set this time specifically aside, Lord, we pray that you would 
draw us to this place that we would come together as your people, united to sing and be thankful for what you provide for us in this earth. Yes, we pray for all the ordinary other organizations, our BB, our GB, our Sunday School, Lord, all the other organizations which are still in the process of planning and looking at guidelines. And Lord, we pray that they would all play their part in our witness in this little corner of your kingdom where you've placed us. So Lord, thank you for this time of prayer. Lord, we thank you for all these situations that have been spoken about and all the others, Lord, that have been brought to your mind. And Lord, we pray that you would accept our prayers and our petitions for others. And Lord, in your time and your will, Lord, you will speak into those situations and answer those prayers. For we leave them with you in and through the name of your Son and our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus himself. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to, to turn to God's word, we're going to sing uh, that uh, hymn as a kind of modern rendition uh, of the psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. Uh, we know the song, certainly from this uh, part of the country. We should know it all too well along the fucking side. So let's, let's stand uh, and let's uh, sing this uh, together. <laughs>
happy endings, uh, as you'll see from uh, the, the slide today, is the title of today's talk, because we all love a happy ending, don't we? doesn't matter whether we're reading a book or, or watching a film or, or whatever it is, we, we like to see things work out well in the end, don't we? That's what sells the story as such to us. We watch the whole struggle of the, the underdog and then we see them overcome in the end. Cinderella marries her prince. The ugly duckling turns out to be a swan. The hero catches the villain. Two of the most unlikely characters struggle through life apart and then they find true love at the end. We all love a happy story, don't we? We all love the happy ending, just like one of my favorite films in the whole world, Shrek. It's a wonderful film, isn't it? A heartbreaking love story of, of Shrek and Princess Fiona. And you laugh at it. It's terrible. It's a wonderful love story, isn't it? The ugly ogre sets off on his epic journey to rescue the, the beautiful princess from the tower of a remote castle where he has to cross the river of molten lava and fight a fire-breathing dragon, and all for someone else, the, the rich Lord Farquhar. And of course, on that journey, he falls in love, but doesn't think that anybody could love her, someone as ugly as him. And then, well, in the end, you know the story, don't you? It turns out that she does love him, and she magically turns into an ogre too, and they get married and live happily ever after. You could almost cry just thinking about it, couldn't you? We all love a happy ending, don't we? And of course, as we thought about last week, there was this happy ending to Jonah's story. As we saw the entire city of Nineveh repent and cry out urgently and earnestly, we were told, to God to save them from destruction. 120,000 souls were saved. Now that is a happy ending, isn't it? Now, of course, just like the stories and the films we love, it, it has been the, the usual rocky road of a story up to that point too, hasn't it? Right from the very start of the story, Jonah is called by God to go to this horrible city full of what he believed to be full of horrible people. A city that was full of every kind of evil, debauchery, idolatry, and so on. A city that was spiritually dark and dead. And when we look at places like Nineveh in the light of God's holiness and, and hatred of sin, we could say, in some sense, Jonah might have been right. It might well have, well and truly deserved God's judgment on it. They had it coming to them, as we might say in our words today. That's what Jonah thought, wasn't it? They deserved everything that God could throw at them. In our terms, I suppose today, really God? You want me to go and preach to those boys? Not at all. Give it to them with both barrels. They've been asking for it. I mean, they've been carrying on with their debauchery and evilness and so on. But God tells Jonah that regardless of that, he wants to save the people of Nineveh. I wonder, are we like Jonah? Is that what Jonah said? God had no business sent them to save those sinners. Didn't want to speak to them. So off he goes down to Joppa and jumps in the first ship he can find and sails off into the sunset to try and run away from God. We've covered the whole story. You know it well enough by now, don't you? He's thrown overboard by the sailors as they try to save themselves from the violent storm that God has brewed up. He ends up in the belly of the fish. He finally gets down on his knees and repents of his own sin and disobedience. And when he does that, God saves him. 
great fish vomits him onto the seashore and off he goes to Nineveh and tells them we looked at last week the message that God had given him for them you have 40 days to repent or God will destroy you you have 40 days to repent or God will destroy you I know we looked at the revival in Nineveh last week and the ingredients as such of that revival and of any revival, in fact. We recognized God's message from his word to us today and the world today that it is time, well, the time has come to repent and believe the good news that Jesus died for our sin. We have faith and trust in him. You can be forgiven and enjoy life in a personal relationship with God. That's our message today. Of course, we saw some of the actual ingredients of what it means to repent, that genuine mourning for sin, that real and actual turning away from sin and turning towards God and faith for forgiveness. And folks, as you think about that message we thought about last week, I don't know about you, but that challenging message has still been ringing in my ears. And it's that that I want to think about a little bit more today. So I've thought about that simple message God gave to Jonah to tell the people of Nineveh about having 40 days to repent or face judgment. Does that not click something in your mind. I'm going to give my strange mind away again here, but as I thought about you have 40 days to repent or face judgment, I brought another film to my mind. Not Shrek this time, but if you've ever seen it, The Bucket List. Anybody seen the film starring Jack Nicholson and, and Morgan Freeman? If you know the film, the story focuses around two men who have been told they have only so long left to live. Their time is limited and so they want to make sure they do all the things they wanted to do before they kick the bucket as such. It's about like none of us, isn't it? Where the people are essentially told they've got 40 days left to live. In the, in the film, yep, Nicholson and Freeman head off together to fulfill this great bucket list they've got. You know the scenario even if you haven't seen the film. They make a list of things. Help a complete stranger for a common good. Laugh till I cry. Kiss the most beautiful girl in the world. Of course, they list a few special places to visit, like the pyramids or the Taj Mahal. And then off they go. Spend the rest of their days enjoying themselves and doing just that, all that is on their list. Why that film came to mind is fairly obvious now, isn't it? Jonah's simple message to Nineveh, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And I guess the challenge of the question that that raises for us is, what would you do? What would you do if you were told you only had 40 days left to live? Imagine for a minute you're living in Nineveh. Did you hear those terrible words from the prophet saying you have only 40 days before God ends it all? Would you be like Nicholson and Freeman and run off and try and fulfill your personal bucket list? Get all the enjoyment you can out of this life before it ends? Would you get busy living or busy dying, as they say? Would you try to make the most of your 40 days? Or would you just wait for it to come? What would you do if I told you today that you have 40 days before God ends it all? I think if we're honest... Most of us, if we knew that, we'd probably make an effort to get busy living, wouldn't we? 
We would try and do all the things that we haven't been able to do up to this point. But when we look at that question from a spiritual perspective, when God gives us the awful news that sin destroys our relationship with him, when he very clearly tells us that we're dying spiritually because of our sin that separates us from him, what do we do? Do we get busy living for God? Or do we get busy living for the world and dying in our sins? What would you do if God gave you 40 days to get rid of your sin? Would you try and get rid of it as soon as you became aware of it? Get on living life to the full that like God promises? Or will you continue the way you are and wait until the last day to get rid of it? Jonah's message, we know from last week, was a call to repent. It was a call for them to turn away from their sin, to get rid of it, to call on God and to turn to him and ask, ask him to forgive them for their sin. And the good news, the happy ending to our story so far here in chapter 3, is that they done just that, that the people of Nineveh didn't wait another second, did they? Never mind 40 days. They repented. It's a wonderful turnaround, isn't it? And certainly as I, I think about the, the happy ending for them, there's one last thing that's worth noticing about this great revival before we move on and leave it behind. As I've said God chose to give them 40 days to think about how they were living at the minute and how far away from God that actually was. But the Ninevites chose not to even let a day pass to take God at his word, to seek his mercy and forgiveness. Do you not think that's incredible? Even though they had 40 days, they chose to repent straight away. The Ninevites, pagan enemies of Israel, living in sin and lawlessness, are now being changed into people longing for repentance and full of hope in God. The very king took God's word to heart and turned away from his old life and chose to live for God right away. And he issued that proclamation to the whole city. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence so that we will not perish. It's an incredible story of revival, isn't it? But I think there's something even more incredible here about this story. Because they chose to repent even when there was no promise or guarantee that God would relent. Think about it. There was no promise or assurance that God would relent at all. Yet they humbled themselves before God. That's incredible, don't you think? But what does that say about us and to our world today when we do have the assurance that when we humble ourselves before God and ask for, for, ask for forgiveness, we know for certain that God and his amazing grace will forgive us. Even without any promise or assurance, the Ninevites repented straight away. And for us today, we have that assurance. We know for certain that when we humble ourselves before God and ask for forgiveness, he will save us. That's what God's been telling us throughout history, isn't it? When the prophet Joel was preaching about how terrible judgment day would be, he still issued the call at the end that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When Paul was writing to the church in Rome, he reminded well, them and us about the exact same thing. 
There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, he says. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Why? For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. It echoes Peter's talk, Cornelius' house, that's recorded for us in the book of Acts. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's what God's been telling us all throughout history, isn't it? We have the promise and the assurance of forgiveness of our sins. We have the promise and assurance of salvation. Yet some people still miss it. Folks, we are in a really privileged position today. Everybody here in Nineveh and Jonah's day whether they were Jews or Gentiles, it didn't matter. It could only look forward to this promised Messiah who would give his life for the sins of the world. We're looking back at him. When we look to the cross, we see the promise has been fulfilled. The Messiah has come. God's message is still the same. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord, will be saved. And we know it for certain because we look to the cross, the fulfillment of this prophetic message. Now, isn't that incredible? Even more incredible than Jonah and Nineveh, isn't it? Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Let me close for now today with a, a few a few words from Peter. It's where he's talking to what he calls fellow Israelites. People who knew the message. People who knew the way of salvation. People who knew all those words of the prophets, pointing them to the promise of the Messiah. Yet they were folk who never grasped the promise. Folk who never knew or experienced the blessing of knowing Jesus in their lives. They knew the message. And yet they rejected the message. I wonder, does that sound familiar? I wonder, is that, is that really a description of your experience? Whether you're sitting at home or whether you're sitting here in this meeting house? Maybe you've sat in the pews of a meeting house all your life. You've heard the message, you know the message, you've listened to the gospel as it has been preached time and time again. You know the promise of salvation. Yet you haven't really grasped it yet. And Peter says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Folks, I'm not telling you you've got 40 days Time is short. We don't know whether it's 40 days, 4 days, or 400 years. But time is short. And today, the word of the Lord is coming to you more than a second time. The time has come to repent and to believe the good news. We all love a happy ending, don't we? Will your story have a happy ending? Because folks, eternity is a long time to be wrong. Today, says Scripture, is the day of salvation. Today is the day to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. 
Let me pray with you. Let's, let's pray. Father, as we think of your amazing gospel, as we think about your amazing grace available to each and every one of us, we put our faith and trust in you for our salvation. Lord, when we know that assurance of salvation, when we know that in our hearts and have accepted it, surely we stand back in awe and wonder at the promise of salvation for us lowly sinners. And yet, Lord, as we think about that same message, Lord, it pains us that so many have heard that message yet still don't get it. Lord, we pray even today, we pray for those in the homes that we're speaking into, in the pews that we're speaking into here, for those who know the message. Lord, will you open their hearts? Lord, open up their very souls that they might turn to you or that they might know the joy of that message for the first time today because Lord we, as we've recognized our time time is short Lord we live in the, the last days and we don't know whether it's 4 days 40 years or 400 years today Lord, let it be the day that souls will turn to you and be saved. Lord, again, as we pray to the start, will you move amongst us with the power of your Spirit and draw us to yourself. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to close our last piece of praise. Uh, is well it's a wonderful redemption hymn have you been to jesus for the cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb let's stand and let's sing this powerfully and wonderfully and if you have let's <coughs> sing it with great celebration let's let's worship god together
can I just say, if anyone wants to speak to me about anything, please feel free to come and speak to me after the service. If you want to call in when I'm in the office, uh, I'm more than willing to, to speak to anyone, uh, as I'm sure are any of the elders. Uh, if you are burdened in any way, uh, especially about uh, salvation and so on, we would love to speak to you. Um, but listen, thank you for joining with us in worship today, wherever you've joined from, both here and across the internet. But it's good to have worship with you together. Let's, let's just close uh, together now. Let's, let's pray uh, as we close. Father, we thank you uh, for this time of worship together. And Lord, we do continue to pray that you would draw us all closer to you, or whether that's for the first time or each and every day. Father, will you imprint the message of salvation in our minds? This is how we know you showed your love amongst us. You sent your one and only Son into this world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved you but that you loved us and sent your Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.